Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Church Online. I'm so glad you're with us today. Hey, I want to start us off by saying a huge thank you to all who made last weekend possible and a very big thank you to Jason Knight, our tech director, and all the volunteers that worked so hard. You know, we had a blast with hundreds joining in person and thousands logging in online to participate in our weekend services. And we learned that uncommon unity is not achieved when people hang around with people just like them. Uncommon unity was achieved for us as humans at the cross and then given to us as a gift in the new community that Jesus started where Christ has removed the hostilities between people groups and brought peace. And this changes everything. See, this weekend, we are launching our brand new summer series, Damascus Road Most Loved Passages. You know, early in the summer, we took a vote on favorite passages that you would like to hear a sermon on, and hundreds of votes came in. And we are starting the series by looking at the passage that got the most votes, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. We will learn what it means to be wise. I can't wait to get into it, but before we do, a very dear friend of mine agreed to read these two verses for us. So listen to these words from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and then we'll unpack this awesome passage. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make your paths straight. Thank you, Olivia. Well done. So Proverbs is one of my favorite books of the Bible, and I've read it several times, always with tremendous profit and enjoyment. It is God telling us that He wants us to walk and live in His wisdom. See, what Proverbs is telling us is that devotion to wisdom is inseparable from devotion to God. What that means is that anyone who seeks to be wise without God will have a highly limited, inaccurate, and distorted view of life and its true meaning. So I was really thinking about this, you know, trying to figure out a way to illustrate this that would make it vivid and memorable. And I have an idea that I want to share with you. This is the best way I can think of illustrating what I will be trying to say in the next few minutes. So we're going to engage in an exercise. You know, most of you, I think, are aware of microphotography. You know, microphotography is extreme close-up photography of small subjects um, or organisms or objects. And I remember the first time, you know, I saw it was in an article when I was in college. And, you know, magazines publish this all the time, and they try to make you guess what it is. So we'll do something similar today. I will show you an extreme close-up of an object, and I will ask you to try and identify it. Now, if you're watching it at home, I want you to turn to the person next to you and try to guess what these photographs are of. Now, those of you that are logged in online, in, uh, you know, you can go to that chat section and try to drop in a guess what you think these objects are. Okay, everyone ready? Here we go. Here's the first one. Take a look at this. What do you think this is? It's got yellow and beige colors to it. So we'll give you five seconds to take a guess. And uh, you can turn to the person next to you um, if you're watching this at home with someone or if you're in the chat section, just drop your answer there. All right, here we go. Here's what it is. It is a pencil. So that was an easy one. I wanted to start at the beginner level. Let's move to the intermediate level. Here's the next one. What do you think this is? It's got bluish tinges and it looks metallic. We'll give you five seconds. Turn to the person next to you, take a guess. And if you're in the chat section, just write in your answer right now. What do you think this is? It is a razor, a razor. Now, that might have been a little harder. All right, here's the next one. What is this thing that is silver-colored and rounded? Again, this is a beginner level. This should be easy. So take a moment. Write in your guess in the chat section or turn to the person next to you. Take a guess. And the correct answer is it is a paper clip, a paper clip. All right, we'll move back to the intermediate level. This next one, it has brownish tinges and white in the middle. Take a guess. What do you think this thing is? It is an Oreo cookie. All right, one more. This is at the advanced level. What is this white straw-like thing? 
We'll give you five seconds. Turn to the person next to you, take a guess. And if you're online on a chat section, just, just drop in your answer there. All right, here it is. It is a toothbrush. So how did you do? You know, I thought of this to give you a picture of what I think the writer of Scripture, and more specifically the book of Proverbs, is trying to tell us. That trying to live a life without God is trying to make sense of a microphotograph. You just don't have the full picture. You will go through life with a partial, distorted view of life. And if you want to get the full picture of your life, the entire story, the real truth about you, to live your life with wisdom, then you need to live your life with God. The two are inseparable. So let's talk about wisdom for a moment. You know, wisdom in our world is often confused with information. It is even confused with a person's IQ or the number of degrees a person has. All of those things are good things. But in the world of the Bible, in the Old Testament world of the text, wisdom was none of that. So what is wisdom? How can you and I be wise? If it's not information, if it's not a high IQ, if it's not just getting a degree, what is it? What is it? So to answer that, I will have to set the proper context and take you into the mindset of the writer here, King Solomon, into the world behind the text. In chapter 3 of the book of 1 Kings, we find the story of King Solomon. God comes to him in a dream and says to him, ask for whatever it is you want. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. That is a really interesting verse. Ask for whatever you want me to give you. I want you to think about that for a moment. I know I, I, I just let those words just just stay around in my mind for a while as I was preparing this message. If God were to come to me today and say, ask for whatever you want me to give you, what would I say? What would I say? What would you ask for? Very interesting verse. Solomon's response is remarkable. This is what he says, 1 Kings 3, verses 7, 8, and 9. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I'm only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart, a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? So much is packed in this passage. You know, I've read this before, and my mind always goes to those two words, discerning heart. But this time, as I read this again a couple of days ago, this is what stood out to me. You know, Solomon identifies himself primarily not as an Israelite, not by his national identity. He identifies himself not by his career, the king. He goes to the core of who he knows he really is, a servant of the Lord, a servant of the Lord. If we want to be wise, we need to view life and all our choices and decisions from our primary identity as a servant of the Lord. That is the first step to living a life full of wisdom. The knowledge of his identity allows Solomon to ask for something not for himself, but for others, for others. The Bible tells us that God was so pleased with Solomon's answer that he gave him wisdom and a very great insight. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men in the East. That's what the Scripture tells us. His wisdom was greater than everyone in Egypt. People from all over came to listen to him. Under Solomon, Israel and Judah flourished. In fact, you know, it says in 1 Kings 4.20, it says, the people were happy. What a beautiful description. Under his rule, the people were happy. This was the golden age for the nation of Israel. The people were happy. And some of Solomon's greatest contribution are the Proverbs. Solomon would remind his people that wisdom is tied to a life rooted in God, and it is a path that must be walked every day. Beyond anything he constructed, beyond all of his wealth, beyond all the expansion of his kingdom, is the book of Proverbs, which continue to speak to us today. And it is this man, granted incomparable wisdom by God himself, who then gave us these words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him and He will make your paths straight. Now, if you look at the pattern in Proverbs chapter 3, you will find that the first 10 verses are written as two-verse couplets. 
The pattern is that each of these is written as a command followed by a description of the type of blessing that comes with following that command. So let's start with the first line, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If you want to avoid living with a distorted view of life, if you want to live a life of wisdom and meaning and understanding, you have to start here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Like Solomon, base your identity in Him. That word trust, by the way, is a verb that was used in the ancient Near East to describe the act of someone throwing himself on their, on their face. Someone just throwing themselves on their face. A.W. Tozer puts it this way, For true faith, it is either God or total collapse. And not since Adam stood up on earth has God failed a single man or woman who trusted him. This is the root from which a meaningful, wise living can be achieved. Trust in the Lord. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The next line is really interesting, and it needs some context. And lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. What this is, I think it's important to say here, what this is not saying, what this is not saying is that we should give up thinking or not do any work on finding information and knowledge. Far from it. God has given us a mind, and we have to take care of it and use it. You know, some people wrongly interpret this line to say they will make no effort. I'm not going to make any attempt. I'm not going to do any hard work of thinking. I'm just going to trust in the Lord. That's not what this means. See, God is not opposed to us using our minds to think, to evaluate all options, to make decisions. What is opposed to God's will is to do these things outside of our identity of who we are in Christ. You and I are to trust understanding that comes from God's interpretation of our lives and ways to live. Next verse, verse 6. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. We are to keep him first in every aspect of our lives. Every aspect of our lives. Now, I want to say a word about paths. You know, a path is a very common metaphor used in both Psalms, the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs. The idea here is not that God will grant me an individualized path to success, wealth, or status. In fact, a successful life or a prosperous life in the Hebrew context was not necessarily equal to a life of wealth or status. A successful life is primarily a life that is lived experiencing shalom, the peace of God, a life where the soul flourishes. So I'm going to ask you to consider this, consider this question. How is your soul these days? Is it at peace? Is your soul flourishing? Proverbs gives us the blueprint for living a truly successful life. You start by trusting the Lord with all your heart and living your life from that place of overflow. Are you living your life fully trusting the Lord? Or are you propping up your life with other substitutes? Is your primary identity rooted in God? Or is your primary identity rooted in something else? Until and unless we confront the reality of the substitute props that have taken the place of God in our lives, we cannot live a wise and meaningful life, a life characterized by the presence of God's peace in our souls. You know, about 15 years ago, I read Anne Lamott's book, Bird by Bird, and one particular passage so impacted me that I clipped it and I you know, have it up on a bulletin board, and I've read it many times. This is what she writes. This is so powerful. She says, we all want God, but left to our own devices, we seek all the worldly things, possessions and money and looks and power, because we think they will bring us fulfillment. But this turns out to be a joke because they are just props. And when we check out of this life, we have to give them back to the great prop master in the sky. They're just on loan. They're not ours. See, we fill our lives with props, trusting them with all our heart, and it ends up leading to a hollow and meaningless life. So how do we get from there to a life lived with God's wisdom? How do we go from here to there? You need to face the reality of where you are so you can get to the reality of who you really are and live the reality of the life you were meant to live. You need to face the reality of where you are so you can get to the reality of who you really are and live the reality of the life you were meant to live. You know, I was at this point of my message, and a thought just ran through my mind, and I want to share a story with you on how we need to confront the reality of where we are 
and how we get to the reality of who we really are and who we really were meant to be. I actually, this is funny, I actually remembered a conversation I had with uh, Pastor Roger Record 20 years ago. So this happened, those of you that have been around that long, uh, you know our time at the ministry center. So this conversation took place at the ministry center, outside uh, of the ministry center. And we were just chatting about books. And he told me, I still remember this, he told me at that time that the book that most influenced him as a Christian was the Ragamuffin Gospel by Brennan Manning. Now, I had heard about that book, but not read it. So I read it, and I will always be grateful to Roger because that book changed my life in so many ways. Great book. It's one of my top ten books of all time. So I was at this point in my message, and I remembered a part of the book as I was writing this sermon. And I want to share with you a story Brennan Manning writes in this book. Now, Brennan Manning, as some of you may know, battled alcoholism throughout his life. So he writes about a time when he was a young man and he was a patient at an alcohol rehab center in Minneapolis. And the group sessions in the rehab center was led by a very interesting therapist named Sean Murphy O'Connor. And they had this ritual where these men would get in a room and they would sit in a U-shaped formation and they had one seat in the middle and the therapist, Sean Murphy O'Connor, he would just select one person from the group to sit on what was called the hot seat and he would start his therapy after that. Now on, on that day uh, that Manning is telling us a story of, in the hot seat in this group is a guy named Max. Now Max is a nominal Christian, he's got swagger and confidence, he owns his own business, he's a re relatively wealthy guy, but he refused to acknowledge the truth about his problem with alcohol. So after a few questions, Sean, Sean Murphy O'Connor finally asked him, how long have you been drinking like a pig, Max? He's a very Irish therapist. Max yells out, that's unfair. And Brennan Manning writes that it took relentless cross-examination and then the therapist makes phone calls to bars that Max frequented before Max finally admitted that he kept two cases of vodka in the garage, along with a case of gin, some bourbon and scotch, also a bottle of vodka in his nightstand, a bottle of gin in his suitcase when he traveled, and three more at his office to entertain clients. And then Max says, you know, I may have understated the problem. Right after he says that, someone from the group yells out, Max, you're a liar. Max winces and he shouts back to the man, I want to remind you the image in the gospel about the speck in your brother's eye and the two by four in your own. And the other one in Matthew about the pot calling the kettle black. Now, the pot calling the kettle black isn't really in the Bible. You know, Max didn't quite know the Bible as well as he thought he did. Anyway, the therapist, Sean, asks the next question. Max, have you ever been unkind to your children? Max thought he might have been to his daughter last Christmas, but he couldn't remember the details. Sean says, give me the phone. And he calls Max's wife, and he puts her on the speakerphone in front of the 25 men. And she comes on the phone, and she says, hello. And Sean says, hello, ma'am. I'm calling in the middle of a group therapy session. Your husband has just told us he was unkind to your daughter last Christmas Eve. Can you give us the details, please? She could. She could. Last Christmas Eve, on the way home from buying his daughter Debbie some shoes, Max stopped at a tavern. He locked little Debbie in the car to keep her warm in the 12-degree weather and drank starting at 3 in the afternoon. When he came out of the bar, he was drunk, and it was midnight. The engine had stopped. Debbie was badly frostbitten on both ears on her fingers. Her thumb and her forefinger were amputated, and she would be deaf for the rest of her life. So Brennan Manning writes, he's watching all this unfold. And that when his wife was telling the story on the speakerphone to the 25 men gathered there, Max just collapsed from his chair like a man who was having a heart attack. And he dropped to his knees and he sobbed hysterically, not me, that's not me, that's not me. I don't have time to tell you the rest of the story, but that was the starting point for Max finding God. In the months that followed, Manning writes, Max became the most open, sincere, vulnerable, affectionate man in the group. And then one day, Max started praying. And the story goes on. He found God.
So may I ask you, how long has it been since you've been drinking like a pig? Sorry, was that bad of me? Do you guys think I should leave that on, Andy, Darlene, Tanya? Think I should leave, them, leave that in? Jason Knight, do you think I should leave that in? So I think the people in this room feels like I should leave that in. I'm sure I'm going to get some texts and emails on that. But seriously, let's get real about our problems and issues and props that we built in our lives. Bring it to God. Get healed. Be made whole. I need this. You need this. Don't waste this season. Don't waste this crisis. Don't waste the pain. So you need to face the reality of where you are so you can get to the reality of who you really are and live the reality of the life you were meant to to live. So I'm asking each of you watching this, who do you trust? Where do you draw your primary identity from? Are you leaning on God or your own understanding? Are you submitting to Him in all your ways? I'm asking you today to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that shames you and terrifies you and alarms you and embarrasses you and humiliates you and holds you back as a prisoner. You can trust Jesus with it because here's the deal. Here's the deal. Catch this. Jesus is the fulfillment of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He's the fulfillment. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Jesus is the wisdom of God. Colossians 2.3 tells us that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Think about this for a moment. Who is the Lord we need to trust with all our heart? It is Jesus. He is Lord. In Matthew 12.42, by the way, Jesus makes this extraordinary claim about himself. Think about this for a moment. This is what he says. Someone greater than Solomon is here. Now, someone greater than Solomon is here. This is an extraordinary claim to make. It was an extraordinary claim to make in Jesus' days. How could a poor, homeless carpenter's son be greater than Solomon? See, what Jesus was saying is that God's kingdom isn't about horses and chariots and palaces and wealth and status and power. God's kingdom from the beginning was about transformed hearts and minds to reflect humans as God intended for us and our world to be. Now, some in Jesus' day made the mistake of thinking the kingdom of God was going to come with political and military and economic power. It didn't. It doesn't. Jesus is the Lord. He is earth's righteous and rightful king. He's the one we can trust. And Jesus is God's plan for making a path straight. In fact, he became the straight path for us. See, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the straightened path. He has removed all obstacles between us and God. And he's able to remove your sin, your guilt, your shame, and has made a way to God through his finished work on the cross. You can trust him with all your heart. The question is, will you? Will you? Will you trust Him? Now, I wrote out a few things, additional things to this message, and I'm just going to say it. You know, maybe you're watching this, and maybe your situation is awful right now, and you're wondering if God can handle your situation. Well, let's see. This God can create everything out of nothing. He can part the Red Sea. He can make water come out of a rock. He can turn water into wine. He can walk on water and calm a storm. What I'm trying to tell you is this. Yes, you can trust Him with all your heart. Maybe you're watching this, and maybe you feel like your life isn't worth much, and you don't matter to God or to anybody, and you're wondering, what is the real truth about you? Well, let's see. He's the one who created you. Nothing is hidden from Him, not your past, not your present, not your future. God knows exactly when you got up this morning. He knows what you had for breakfast. He knows all your thoughts. He knows when you lie down and when you get up. Before you can speak, God knows what words you're going to use. God is ahead of you and behind you at every moment. His presence is all around you. You can't hide from God. If you climb Sugarloaf Mountain, He's there. If you go boating at Lake Linganore, He's there. If you go beyond the galaxies, even there His hand will guide you. His right hand will hold you fast. He made you fearfully and wonderfully. You are his masterpiece. What I'm trying to say to you is this. Yes, you can trust him with all your heart. Maybe you're watching this and maybe you're new to church and don't know a whole lot about Jesus. And you're saying, you know what? Trust depends upon the character of the person in whom you place your trust. Can Jesus, can this Jesus be trusted? 
Well, let's see. There's no one wiser than he is. There's no one more powerful than he is. There's no one more gracious than he is. There's no one more forgiving than he is. There's no one more merciful than he is. His character is faultless. His strength is without equal. His presence is constant. His promises are sure. His goodness is inexhaustible. His grace is sufficient. His love for you is immeasurable. What I'm trying to say to you is this. Yes, you can trust him with all your heart. Maybe you're watching this and maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart right now and you're wondering if God can truly forgive you for your sins, of all the terrible, horrible, no good things that you've done and, and said. Well, let's see. He defends the weak. He releases the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He welcomes the repentant. He mends the brokenhearted. He opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. He can save us from our sins and our shame. He hears our prayers and answers them. He's coming back to claim all of creation, which rightfully belongs to him anyway. What I'm trying to say to you is this. Yes, you can trust him with all your heart. Maybe you're watching this and maybe you feel like a prisoner like Max and you're wondering if God can free you from your prison, whatever that prison may be. Well, let's see. He can heal the leper. He can make the lame walk and the blind see. He can take on human form and be born as a baby and laid in a manger. And when they crucified him and killed him and laid him in the tomb, he has he had enough power to roll the stone away and rise from the dead. What I'm trying to say to you is, yes, you can trust him with all your heart. So I'm going to ask you, what is it that God is telling you right now that you need to bring to him and trust him with it? I'm asking you today to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with everything that shames you and terrifies you and alarms you and embarrasses you and humiliates you and holds you back. Everything that has got you in its grip, you can bring it to God. You can bring it to Christ. Like Max, you have to let go of your pride. Confess your sins and your need for Him. Come to Him. Then you'll be able to zoom out and see, not the distorted, limited view of your life, but the full picture of your life. How it fits into the grand and greater story of God. The life that you were meant to live. So we're going to end our time together this weekend with a simple but really powerful song which celebrates the goodness of our God. I want you to sing along. In fact, if you're watching this at home, you might want to just stand up and just join in and use this time to bring whatever it is you need to bring to God and then declare your trust in the goodness and mercy and love of our God. Love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. For all my days, I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God.
so good with every breath that I am able or oh, I will sing of the goodness of God He is good all the time, all the time. He is good. He is good. You can trust Jesus with all your heart. Remember, what Proverbs is telling us is that devotion to wisdom is inseparable from devotion to God. What that means is that anyone who seeks to be wise without God will have a highly limited, inaccurate, and distorted view of life and its true meaning. You can have God's wisdom. You can have God's wisdom. In fact, the Bible says, if any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. I've relied on this promise again and again, hundreds of times in my life. So, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. What I've attempted to convey today to you is that, yes, you can indeed trust Him with all your heart. But God bless you. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters watching this today. Um, I pray that you help each and every one of us live the life that you, we were meant to live, walking closely with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who came to make the path straight for me, for all of us. Father, I pray for anyone who's struggling or stressed or hurting in pain, uh, will, you, will you touch them? Will you fill their hearts with your love? Will you, will you fill them with your peace? Would you, will, you, will you help them experience your goodness and your mercy? I lift each and every person to you. And I ask that we live each day trusting you and not leaning on our own understanding, acknowledging you in all our ways, knowing you will make our path straight. We put all our trust in the days ahead in that promise. We know we can trust you. We pray this in the beautiful, matchless, powerful, amazing, sweet and good name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the church, wherever the church is, said, Amen and Amen.